giving a couple more minutes for everybody to log in and get to Jennifer will give us a thumbs up. Okay, we're ready. Okay. So thank you, Jen Matos, for welcoming our early arrivals. And I would like to welcome everyone to our virtual celebration, which means we don't have to wear a mask, but I thought it might be appropriate that we start this way. We are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, giving women the right to vote. I am Carol Mulready, a board member of the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford. We are very pleased to partner with the Noel Webster House and West Hartford Historical Society and with WHCTV and Interactive to bring you this special presentation to celebrate women's suffrage. West Hartford's town historian and League of Women Voters member, Dr. Tracy Wilson is our presenter. The Connecticut Centennial Celebration of Women Getting to Vote is occurring throughout the 20, year 2020. This year also marks the beginning of the League of Women Voters. It is our 100th anniversary. This league was started because the suffragists realized that so many of the women who are now able to vote needed to be educated about how to vote and about the issues that would be brought to the electorate. So for the last hundred years, League of Women Voters has been working as a nonpartisan political organization which encourages informed and active participation by citizens and government. And Dr. Wilson will be demonstrating some of that political organization that got us the vote. By the way, today, September 15th, is the 100th anniversary of Governor Holcomb's calling the legislature into session to add Connecticut's name to the list of states that approved the 19th Amendment after it had been ratified. Dr. Wilson will speak about the history of Connecticut women's suffrage movement and the League of Women Voters through the lives of several Hartford area women. She will focus on the involvement of the activists in the multiple issues as she analyzes their leadership tactics and strategies. There will be question and answer opportunities through the Q&A feature of the Zoom webinar. You will be able to go to the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on the Q&A tab. This will open the box for you to type your questions. Our question master is Jennifer Matos, and she will be um, taking care of those questions and making sure that we combine duplicate questions. So I am pleased to be joined here for our virtual event by Jen Evans, our most capable partner and director of the executive of um, the West Hartford Community Television and Interactive. Also our partner, Jennifer Matos, Executive Director of the Noah Webster House. And of course, our guest speaker, Tracy Wilson. COVID-19 has brought many changes during this year. I'm sure many of you have experienced bumps in the road for this seven month challenge during Zoom and other activities. We hope tonight that everything goes smoothly and um, that you will all learn something that you didn't know before. So at this point, I am going to turn the program over to Jennifer Matos to welcome you on behalf of the Noah Webster House. Thank you, Carol. Hey, Carol. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Matos, and it's a pleasure to be with you here tonight um, virtually. This is actually my, my first uh, official Zoom meeting open to the public, so this is really exciting. Um, and we're so pleased to be working with the League of Women Voters and West Harper Community Interactive, and of course, our beloved town historian, Dr. Tracy Wilson. 
Um, she's kind of our resident lecturer over at the Noah Webster House and West Hartford Historical Society. And you might recall our annual meeting last year um, in 2019 was kind of kicking off uh, the anniversary of the struggle for women's suffrage. Um, and she uh, presented a really great lecture then, and I'm excited to hear what she has to say tonight. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with, with the Noah Webster House and West Hartford Historical Society, we are a nonprofit museum that is dedicated to um, preserving, maintaining, interpreting, and sharing the birthplace of Noah Webster, who we consider to be truly a forgotten founding, founding father who really had his hand in establishing an American language in our country at a time when it, it wasn't so certain that our country would survive. Um, and we also serve as the repository for all things West Hartford history. So what um, Noah Webster happens to be uh, perhaps uh, West Hartford's most famous son, uh, but we certainly have a lot of other history in town besides Noah Webster. And it, it is our privilege to collect and preserve that material um, for future generations, um, including stuff that relates to women's suffrage. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tracy Wilson, whom I'm sure many of you uh, know already. Tracy taught history at West Hartford Public Schools for over 35 years. She taught a course in local history at Connors High School and wrote articles for West Hartford Life for 15 years. She was named town historian by the town council in 2004. Um, and she uh, most recently converted all of those articles that she had written into a book called Life in West Hartford, which is available in a hardcover edition at the Noah Webster House or on our website. And there's also an ebook version of that available as well. And uh, there are so many fabulous articles that talk about these kind of little tidbits of information about West Hartford history. Um, Tracy, has a BA and a MA from Trinity College and a PhD in history from Brown University. And she lives here in West Hartford with her wife, Beth Bye. Um, so thank you, Tracy. Can't wait to hear your lecture. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Carol and Jen. It's really a treat for me to be able to speak to you virtually about women's suffrage, a topic about which I am passionate. I'm so happy to be here sponsored by three of my favorite West Hartford organizations, the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford, whose goal is to make educated voters and encourage voting. Um, the Noah Webster House and West Hartford Historical Society wants us to understand our past and know the importance of words and West Hartford Community Interactive, which is doing so much to help us, uh, to keep us connected during the pandemic. Thanks to Carol Mulready, Jen Matos, and Jen Evans for all they do for this community. With but seven weeks left to the election, I hope this talk about voting will re reinforce your will to exercise the franchise as you learn how the suffragists saw their role in this democracy as going far beyond voting. Uh, their ideas of civic engagement were wide ranging as I would venture to guess fits many of you in the audience today. I thought, uh, as I looked at this first screen, I thought I should give a quiz to start. Can anyone name any of these people and then bring it back at the end and see uh, if you could do that. Um, but hopefully by the end, you will feel like you know these women uh, who are on the screen in front of you. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the opposition to women voting. This is a key part of this story and one that has through lines to today as we see anti-woman propaganda being used against our representative Jillian Gilchrist. The present national administration has appointed a cabinet of 24 people, four of whom are women, the fewest number of women since 1980. Women need to continue to be civically active to retain the gains they have made. Okay, so I wanna start by uh, thinking about uh, this question, why don't people vote? And I'm actually gonna do a poll. So Jen, could you put the poll up on the screen? Hopefully it will appear. Hold on, I have a question now to Jen Evans. Oh, there it is, okay. Oh, good. Okay, so you can just click on, uh, why do you think people don't vote? And you should be able with your cursor to just click on uh, what you 
uh, think, I wonder if I can vote. Yeah. Yeah. I can. Okay, and what do we have? 30 people. So we'll uh, wait to see. Hmm, interesting. And as I look at these answers, uh, it makes me really appreciate uh, what the League of Women Voters does in trying to, um, to be sure that people are registered and to help people to get to know the candidates. Um, so uh, it's really interesting how the, the numbers are pretty evenly spread here. Um, okay, could Jen, could you end this poll? And then uh, I don't know what it means to share the results, but if we stop sharing this one and then pull in uh, the one about why people do vote. And you can start thinking about the reasons uh, while we're waiting for the poll to come forward. I think we had most of the people vote. Nice job. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this one it says, why do people vote? You're much faster on this poll. You got this down. <laughs> we learned to read it a little bit faster, perhaps. <laughs> mm, interesting. So the idea of the civic duty in a democracy um, and, you know, really important now, I think, as this election is being, uh, you know, the re results already being questioned, um, but, uh, you know, it's so important that people see it as their civic duty to uh, make their way to the ballot box in whatever way that happens this year, whether it's in person or um, it is by an absentee ballot. Okay. Um, thanks, Jen. It's a civic duty to vote for someone who represents them. That's really interesting as we think about who represents us here, uh, certainly in our, in our town. Okay. So thank you for, uh, for starting us off with a little uh, interaction and with some reflection on uh, the power that the vote has in, in our lives. Okay, so I am going to move along um, to, uh, and I think I you can just X this poll off your screen. I think that's the way it works. So, um, so um, the reason I'm speaking today is that it was just a hundred years ago this week when Connecticut passed the Nineteenth Amendment, On September Fourteenth, nineteen eighteen. Uh, I'm sorry, nineteen twenty. Finally, Governor Marcus Holcomb was willing to call a special session to vote on the 19th Amendment. Tennessee was the 36th state to ratify, but it was not totally clear that that vote was legal. Connecticut, Connecticut also had to develop legislation that would allow for women to register for the election just six weeks away. Women would have gotten the right to vote in Connecticut even if Connecticut's General Assembly did not ratify the 19th Amendment on September 21st, 1920. They actually did it twice. Uh, so in many ways, 
uh, you might see kinetic struggle for women's suffrage as a failure. We were the 37th state to ratify. But the state story, I would argue, has many successes as well. There was strong opposition to women's suffrage in Connecticut. Though Connecticut was controlled by Republicans, and in fact, in 1920, Republicans get most of women's votes and Republicans mostly supported the amendment, the Republican leadership did not. There was a fear on the part of men that the 200,000 women in Connecticut would change the balance of power here. They feared women voters would close down saloons and brothels, prohibit exploitative labor practices and support temperance. Who were these men that women tried to convince that voting was a right for all adults? Well, you see here J. Henry Rohrbach. He was one of the big reasons that suffrage did not pass in Connecticut. He was the head of the Republican Party and from the northwestern corner of the state. Rohrbach headed the party for 25 years, and he was a fiscal and social conservative. He was uh, joined by uh, two Republican senators, Brenda G. and McLean, who voted against the suffrage amendment in the U.S. Senate. They argued that voting was a state's rights issue. Brenda G., the most conservative, said women should not be worried about suffrage. They had, quote, had better go home and knit bandages and pick lint for the war effort, unquote, during World War I. McLean, also a Republican, opposed suffrage. Nationally, things really heated up in 1919 when the House of Representatives passed the suffrage amendment, and two weeks later on June 4th, the Senate passed the amendment by a vote of 56 to 25. 36 Republicans voted yes, eight Republicans, including our two men, voted uh, no. 20 Democrats voted yes, 17 Democrats voted no. And our Republican governor, Marcus Holcomb, uh, vehemently opposed suffrage. In 1919, he was 75 years old, came of age during the Civil War, and is most known as being a war governor uh, during World War I. Holcomb refused to call the General Assembly into session in the summer of 1920 because he did not see women's suffrage as an emergency, the only reason to call a special session. J. Henry Rohrbach ran the Republican State Committee and he and Holcomb would not be moved. Uh, this political cartoon shows men out of touch with the suffrage issue. Rohrbach uh, in the bottom right corner, looking through the wrong end of the telescope and his elected officials hiding and listening to his every word and look at the power of the women's vote coming in from the West. And another cartoon, uh, Holcomb really uh, digging in his heels, uh, digging his heels in on suffrage being depicted in this political cartoon as the modern King Canute trying to stop the tides. All the while, Canute believes he has the power to do so, aided by his Republican henchmen. Many women opposed suffrage as well. The Connecticut Association opposed to women's suffrage formed in 1911. Uh, this is a 1917 letter to the editor of the Hartford Current from President Grace Markham, where she spells out their positions that you see here to enforce the differences between men and women and preserve the home, to encourage participation in community events, but not through partisan politics. Edith Beach, a West Hartford woman, was a director of the organization, and you can see her name in these two articles here. She sat on stage in uh, 1913 as Lucy Price, an anti-suffragist from Ohio, gave an address at the West Hartford Town Hall, and Beach sat up on the stage along with Addie Arnold and Mrs. H.E. Robbins from West Hartford. It's a little bit surprising to me because Edith Beach uh, was the first West Hartford woman to own and drive a car. And she, like Markham suggested, was very involved in municipal and national affairs. I always love looking at this picture thinking, where is the steering wheel? Uh, but this lever here just acted, you pushed it back and forth and it moved the, and it moved the tires. 
Um, this is the house on South Main Street, now Brightwood Lane, uh, where Edith Beach uh, lived with her two, uh, with her two sisters. Uh, she read, uh, she um, sat on the Red Cross Bureau for West Hartford to support the war effort for World War I. Here you can see her house in the background. Um, and uh, she and her sister Edith uh, and Mary uh, worked to raise money for the 19, in 1918 for the war effort. Uh, they sponsored a French market, which attracted 1,200 people and raised the equivalent of about a million dollars today, what would be a million dollars today, in war bonds. The Beach sisters were really engaged in the town. Um, uh, so just check out this date here, October 22nd, 1918. It's really three, about three weeks before the war ended. Um, but I just realized today uh, that this was all happening during the uh, Spanish influenza pandemic. And um, uh, so uh, um, we had suffrage, World War I, and the Spanish flu epidemic all at once. This article, again, in the current, uh, decries the public health office in Hartford, which isn't taking this seriously, and then goes on to report that the Hartford Golf Club, you may be able to see that, uh, hang on a second, I see that's right here at the bottom of this article, uh, would be used as a temporary hospital for those who contracted the flu. So um, uh, a week later, a, a week after this article is in the paper, the beaches had this event which attracted 1,200 people. It adds a new twist to their civic engagement. Um, 8,500 people died in Connecticut during the flu epidemic. Uh, it came in two waves. Uh, and to compare that, uh, we had 180,000 cases, cases in Connecticut in 1918 and 19, uh, and 8,500 dead. We now have 4,500 people who died of COVID-19 and 54,000 cases. Uh, and I found this uh, uh, ad to get to encourage you to wear a mask, and uh, you can see the reasons here. Don't take another person's breath. Keep your mouth and teeth clean. I haven't heard that now. Avoid those that cough and sneeze. Uh, be in a ventilated place. Uh, don't use common drinking cups. Cover your mouth. Avoid worry, fear, and fatigue. Stay at home if you have a cold. Um, so, uh, it's just interesting to think of these things happening at the same time, which I have never uh, done before. So if we had people who were against suffrage, who, who was for it and who supported it and how did they advocate for the right for women all over the state? Some argue that suffrage started with this woman, Mariah Stewart, born in Hartford in 1803. She gave a speech in Boston in 1832 in which she called for women to be involved in political life. Most people pinpoint the start of the movement in 1848 at the Seneca Falls Convention, but black women who spoke publicly were more than 15 years ahead of them. I commend to you this recently published book by Professor Martha Jones who writes about public political advocacy by black women. She argues that black women in their work for suffrage, in fact, were defining what it meant to be an American. She writes about Hartford Stewart who defined the issues 190 years ago. As a political movement, the 20th century campaign in Connecticut really heated up in 1910 with a generational change in leadership. At that time, the story in the country was pretty messy. Full suffrage in the West, partial suffrage in some states, and no suffrage in 15 states in 1914. In Connecticut, women could vote on education and library issues. This map shows us something that activists like to see, inequality. And this is what leads to a movement. There's not equal access. If you move from one state to another, you could 
lose or gain rights. The Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association, the organization that pushed for the state-by-state -state approach to winning suffrage, hired Emily Pearson in 1910 to organize to convince local legislators to vote for suffrage. She used new strategies in this movement to win the right to vote. And she was really known nationwide for her work. She heard Emmeline Pankhurst from England speak in Hartford in 1909. Pankhurst wanted to bring the suffrage debate to the minds of those who would vote on it in England. And when the suffragists could not get a meeting with the prime minister in 1909, the 3000 police prevented the women from entering parliament and arrested 108 of them. The police were violent. And from this, the women shifted their strategy and they began breaking windows to get their attention. It is after this event in October, 1909, that Pankhurst comes to Hartford to speak. And it's pretty controversial that she's here. She comes to tell her story and Pearson goes to hear her. Pearson takes on direct action techniques after this. Up till 1910, it had all been education and gentle persuasion um, of legislators. She organized numerous auto tours in public places, novel for women to drive, novel to have a mobile platform from which to speak. And one of the things I was reading today said that they brought a bugle with them uh, and so they would go to the center of a town and someone would play the bugle uh, to get people's attention. And then they would start speaking from these uh, mobile platforms. Unlike, uh, let's see, uh, she also organized parades which put women in the public sphere. And here you can say, here it says 85% of teachers in the US are women. Uh, you can see the trolley tracks here. This is down uh, Main Street in Hartford. And uh, there's our votes for women. And then this picture I like for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you can see Sage Allen here. Um, and you can just see women taking over the street. But look at the crowd, it's like seven or eight deep on Main Street watching these women um, uh, advocating for suffrage. Unlike in some other states, Pearson early on made alliances with working women and men and helped to send this deputation to Washington to meet with President Wilson in 1916. Her co-organizer translated her speeches into Italian, French, and German and took the information to the factories in Hartford. Pearson was extremely successful in her work. This deputation included 32 participants from 21 towns and represented 19 different trades and occupations. In 1910, there were 300 members of the Suffrage Association in three cities. Hartford, uh, I think Hartford, uh, Greenwich and Norwalk. By 1917, just seven years later, there were 38,000 members with 100 local organizations. So what led to this change in tactics and the increased involvement of women in advocating for the vote? Um, I would argue that part of it was economic. Uh, the number of women at work uh, grew tremendously over this period of time from 1880 to 1920. You can see in 1880 that uh, there were about 48,000 women workers. By 1920, uh, the number had tripled. The other thing that you see is a move out of domestic work in 1880 is the biggest occupational sector. And by 1920, that is uh, cut in half. And then you see the growth in this sector of clerical work, um, which we could argue is much more independent work than say domestic work is. And so um, I think this is a big part of the change is women, women having some economic power. Another reason is that we're in a war. 
and women are appealed to to work in the war effort. And so this feeling is if we can be part of the war effort and we can help win the war, shouldn't we have the right to vote? And there were some women who, uh, there was some disagreement on the role women should play in the war effort. Some saying, if we don't have the right to vote, why would we participate? And others saying, if we participate, maybe then we get the right to vote. So uh, these two women, Mary Townsend Seymour and Josephine Bennett, were an important part of the, um, of the work to get uh, the vote. Um, and they developed leadership skills in this movement. Mary Townsend Seymour embodies the values of women who were involved in the suffrage movement in Connecticut. This is the only image we have of her. She was an African-American woman advocating uh, for more than, uh, for suffrage and more. She also is one of the founders of the Hartford chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. She was a true progressive reformer of her era, working on issues that included school segregation, lynching, separate public accommodations for blacks, immigration, the Red Cross during World War I, radical politics, and union organizing for tobacco workers. The world she operated in could not have been easy. Blacks made up less than 2% of the 100,000 people who lived in the city of Hartford. Here is the opening line of a Hartford Current article describing what they called the aristocracy of colored people in the city. Their uh, idea or, or the reality of their aristocracy included featuring a messenger, a servant, a pastor, a Senate messenger, and a janitor at Hartford Public High School. The article said, quote, colored people in Hartford in the days of yore seem to have played, a, played well their part as factotums to the first families and in contributing to the comfort and convenience of the white folks generally, praised as sober, happy, and useful, unquote. If this was the height of black society in Hartford from a white perspective, how must that have looked at Mary for Mary Townsend Seymour founding, how much, how must they have looked at Mary Townsend Seymour for founding the NAACP? One way Seymour found her way to power uh, in dealing directly with was in dealing directly with influential white women reformers, including Josephine Bennett. Um, she lived her life as an equal, marching in suffrage parades and organizing meetings. Seymour joined with Bennett to organize women working and processing tobacco during the war years in 1918. In Seymour's visits with African-American families through the Civil Relief Home Service section of the Red Cross, she found some women making as little as $4 per week. And Bennett was very involved in the suffrage movement, both in the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association and the National Women's Party. Seymour actually got a job in a tobacco factory, stripping leaves to understand working conditions. Together, she and Bennett helped organize a group of tobacco workers after they had met at a meeting of the NAACP in 1918. They got the Hartford Central Labor Union and the International Ladies Garment Workers Union to support them. 61 women joined, if only for a short time. Seymour served as secretary of the local with its headquarters at her home at 420 New Britain Avenue in Hartford, uh, not too far from Trinity College. Superintendent of the Hartford Public Schools, Thomas Weaver provoked Seymour in 1917 when he floated the idea that the Hartford Public Schools should be segregated with a separate night school for blacks. He said that white students were making blacks the butt of their jokes and having segregated classes would stop that. Part of the issue was the great migration with Southern blacks making their way to the city during World War I, a group of people who didn't quite know the rules of the North, know that at this time blacks made up just 2% of Hartford's population. Mary Seymour thought a chapter of the NAACP in Hartford could help she called W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary White Ovington, and James Weldon Johnson, author, lawyer, and songwriter. 
these three were key leaders in the organization, which used legal means to press for equality. And they came to Hartford. The pressure from this local NAACP and others forced Weaver to drop his plan for a segregated high school. Seymour understood power and had the ability to bring important stakeholders together. Seymour lent her voice to the suffrage movement as well. And when women won the right to vote in 1920, she was able to vote. There is some misconception about the right of black people to vote. In the national suffrage story, racism in the organizations and a fear that allowing black women to vote in the South would challenge the white supremacy of Southern Democrats. Blacks in the South for all intents and purposes had been disenfranchised by the poll tax, grandfather clause and literacy tax. And if you remember back to our map, none of the Southern states allowed full suffrage for women. Blacks could vote in the North and suffrage here meant suffrage for blacks as well. I don't have great data here, I know, but I did find this chart that showed the percentage of black men voting in 1920 uh, here in Hartford. You can see that 50% of black men voted and about 66% of white men voted in that election. This is not at all to say that blacks were treated equally here or that there was not discrimination, but it is not fair to say that black people were not allowed to vote. Seymour, though not a state leader in the suffrage movement here, was a foot soldier and followed the politics of the movement. In 1917, the leader of the Connecticut women's suffrage movement, Catherine Houghton Hepburn, and board member Josephine Bennett uh, resigned from their leadership in the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association and turned to the National Women's Party. Connecticut's affiliation affiliate to the National Women's Party broke off from the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association in 1917, when many of the leaders wanted more direct action, like Emily Pearson had been advocating since 1910. Josephine Bennett also moved to the National Women's Party, as did Seymour. Hepburn, Hepburn and Pearson were incredible leaders of the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association, so Hepburn's letter to switch to the Women's Party meant something. In her last paragraph, uh, she says, we have gone to war for democracy and yet millions of women in our country are denied the right to vote. Simply mentioning this fact in suffrage journals and to suffrage audiences is futile. We must say it in such a way that all the world will hear. And that is what the pickets of the Women's Party have done at Washington. My sympathies are all in with them. I admire their honesty, their self-forgetfulness, and their practical wisdom. In my opinion, it is through such women as these that we shall secure the suffrage in Connecticut by federal amendment. In the future, I shall, shall support the Women's Party. Yours faithfully, Catherine Houghton Hepburn. In West Hartford, Louise Day, soon to be Louise Day Duffy, she's here joined Hepburn in the Connecticut Women's Party to stump for suffrage in the late 1910s. Duffy's husband Ward served in World War I and Duffy got involved in the suffrage movement after she had two small children at home. So just another uh, local uh, woman. And I think we don't think about uh, you know, we don't think about the differences in transportation, but it was a different world. And Edna Rattel was another West Hartford woman who wanted to do more direct action for her right to vote through the work of the Women's Party. She was a working class woman involved in many issues as well as suffrage. She learned to wield power through her deeds, her principled approach, and her deep sense of values tied to equality. Rattel was the daughter of a cigar maker and a cigar stripper. Her father was a member of Samuel Gomper's Cigar Makers Union. In 1911, he advocated to allow a black man into the union because he knew that blacks, just like whites, paid five cents for a loaf of bread. Fertel's mother was a cigar stripper who belonged to the union as well. Perhaps their paths crossed with Mary Seymour and Josephine Bennett. Edna graduated from Hartford's Night School in 1917 
She held jobs as a babysitter, a clerk at the five and 10, and as a tobacco stripper. At 16, she was elected secretary of the Scar, Make, Scar Strippers Union. And at age 18, she went on to work at the Travelers Insurance Company, which you can see here um, in the filing department. In 1918, at age 19, Patel volunteered in the women's suffrage movement, handing out leaflets in downtown Hartford at lunchtime and going door to door to get signatures on petitions. So uh, still things that are used to organize people today. She recounted in 1918 with the encouragement of Catherine Houghton Hepburn, uh, uh, the leader of the Women's Party, that uh, she go to Washington DC to protest. Pertel was interviewed in 1980 by historian Carol Nichols. She said, I was, I was in Brown Thompson's and Mrs. Hepburn came along. I used to help them give out posters. They used to call me Little Pertel. She said, Little Pertel, could you go to Washington and, you know, be arrested and demonstrate? I said, Mrs. Hepburn, I haven't got any money to go to Washington. I can't afford it. But I did have a week's vacation coming from the travelers. I said, I've got a week's vacation coming, but I can't afford to go. She said, will you go if I pay your way? I said, certainly I will. So that's how I went August, 1918. This short exchange provided a link between two women that might never have been forged had it not been for their mutual involvement in the suffrage movement. Pertel saw herself as a representative of working women. She was arrested four times that day, hauled off to jail, released, and then went back and climbed the statue, uh, Lafayette statue again, calling out, Lafayette, we are here. So they were allowed to silently protest, but once they said something, they could get arrested. She was in Lafayette Park, right across from the White House, uh, recently uh, this park in the news for protests for the Black Lives Matter movement. She carried the American flag, and then another flag that said, I come from Connecticut, the cradle of liberty. They uh, peacefully said, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? The police wanted to take the banners away from them. And Pertel said, oh, I can't give you this banner. This banner is my banner of liberty. No, I can't give it to you. The officer bent back her fingers and broke two of them taking the banner away. Pertel was joined by 26 Connecticut women protesting the Senate delay in voting on the suffrage amendment. The women refused to pay their fines and were sent to Ocacon Workhouse in Virginia, a prison for women convicted of prostitution and drunk drunkenness. Pertel claimed to be the youngest woman ever to be arrested, thrown in jail, and go on a hunger strike for suffrage. Their treatment at the prison and the complaints that poured into President Wilson helped to change his mind about suffrage. Mrs. Markham, who we heard about earlier, the head of the anti-suffragists, warned that the arrested suffragists were allied with the Reds, the communists, and were trying to incite class and race hatred. Uh, quite the opposite, I would say. At the same time, the National Women's Party, led by Alice Paul, thought that to get the amendment passed, they would have to win some Southern states she said they needed a, quote, realistic strategy, unquote, of doing nothing to antagonize Southern politicians. And this, po this position was published in the New York world. The strategy was to say that the vote in the South would not include black women. Seymour, Mary Townsend Seymour, picked up the phone on March, in March, 1919 and called New York City headquarters of the NAACP say how disappointed she was in Alice Paul. Seymour knew that the National Women's Party denied African-Americans a place in a suffrage parade back in 1913. Seymour then wrote to Mary Ovington, telling her she would contact Josephine Bennett because she would never waver on the vote for black women. Seymour knew that Bennett knew Alice Paul quite well and felt that Bennett could sway her. Seymour's power came from her ability to work across race lines and build coalitions. She knew the importance of the franchise for black women, especially, and she ably spoke to and worked with white women leaders and working class women on the suffrage issues. 
When you look at this map, you can see that Alice Paul's strategy was somewhat suspect. In fact, there was one state from the South that did ratify the amendment, Tennessee, but there were three states in the North that did not, Connecticut, Vermont, and Delaware. Seymour saw through Paul's strategy and used her connections and relationships to address the National Women's Party. By March 1920, World War I was over, the Treaty of Versailles rejected, the pandemic ended, but women still didn't have the right to vote. For Seymour, who lived in the city of Hartford where five of the top Hartford factories employed no black women, men or women, she did not see racial equality and women's suffrage as two separate issues. In November, 1920, Mary Townsend Seymour became the first African-American woman to run for the Connecticut State Assembly. The suffrage movement had a profound effect on the women who participated, even though they were not capable of moving those who wanted to keep the vote just for men. The suffrage movement in Connecticut was an incubator for organizing education and building leaders. Cross-class alliances, women lobbying for multiple issues and women divided on an issue that today we might think would unite them. When they won the right to vote in August, 1920, it must have felt like a huge victory for women like Seymour and Pertell. They were not leaders in the movement, but they knew that suffrage was a key to power in a democracy. They surely would have agreed with Ruth DeDorian, uh, this is Ruth here, uh, also a West Hartford resident and press secretary for the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association and lifelong member of the League of Women Voters. What had it all been for, she wrote, do you think that those who led in the work could have carried it on with such indomitable spirit, only in order that women might go to the polls once a year and drop their ballots in a box? Do you think they could have done it if they had not believed that women could use their votes to wipe out the injustices between man and man and between woman and man to lift intolerable burdens from motherhood and childhood? Even if we wanted to, could we possibly escape the responsibility of victory? This responsibility, part of this responsibility for these women went uh, beyond the vote. For Emily Pearson, she went back to school at Yale University to get her medical degree and worked as a school doctor and health director in Cromwell until the mid 1950s. She was particularly interested in women's and children's health and traveled to Russia and China and was intrigued by the ideas of socialism. For Pertel, the responsibility for victory included continuing her work on a large number of pro progressive issues that included wiping out injustice and lifting the burdens from motherhood and childhood. She used her strong core values, her speaking ability and her persistence and stayed in the public sphere. She did not become a part of the League of Women Voters founded here in 1923 because she was a strong believer in partisan politics. She supported the Free Ireland Movement. She was deeply involved with the Federated Democratic Women's Club having leadership roles there. She became a state labor investigator and stayed involved in politics. Louise Duffy also was involved in the statewide Democratic Women's Club. But before that, she was one of the founders of the League of Women Voters in West Hartford. She also ran for office in 1924 for the fifth senatorial district seat as a Democrat just four years after women got the right to vote. She lost but stayed involved advocating for the rights of the poor uh, before the legislature in the 1930s and then serving on the West Hartford Board of Education for 11 years before the four Republican men she served with on the board named the school after her. Here you see the group of women who helped to install a plaque in 1934 at the state capitol to remember the suffrage activists. Two women, Seymour and Pertell, didn't make it to the plaque. This victory meant a lot to them. It was arduous, painstaking and coming and it invested the women with a concentration, commitment, and an activist spirit stronger than it might have if the battle had come easily. For Seymour and P Pertel, 
after 1920, the relationships built, the skills, the confidence, the ability to organize, to make cross-class alliances, cross-racial barriers, and work on issues all helped these two who had power to help those without power to build a stronger community and to win the dignity of all people. Could we add their names to this plaque, which is posted in the state capitol as we learn more about the movement? The vote is powerful, but women didn't turn out to vote in the same numbers as men until 1980. This year, Jillian Gilcrest, Tammy Exum, and Kate Farrar show us the power of women in elections. These women make up West Hartford's Democratic slate for the General Assembly this year, the first time we could have three women in the legislature. And Sherry Cantor is our mayor, Deb Polin, a strong League of Women Voters member leads our Board of Education. 100 years of civic engagement has brought us here. So here we see the confluence of women's civic engagement, World War I and the flu pandemic. Today we see the confluence of COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement and women's political power. Women lead in different ways than men, and the League continues to inform citizens and electeds on key issues in the community to get people to choose to vote. Be sure you exercise the franchise as we stand on the shoulders of those who came before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, I um, did not see a question. Does anyone in the audience have a question for Dr. Wilson before we um, give our thanks and finish our program? <clears throat> All thorough information for sure, Tracy. I'm. Um, always amazed how much we don't know um, about about this and, and I'm afraid so many of our young people today have no idea um, what what our four mothers went through. Well I will uh, say Carol uh, that last year I uh, brought I, I spoke in uh, three different classes in the high school um, uh, giving a talk on women's suffrage. And so um, I do think, I, I didn't learn anything about it when I was in high school. So I do think students are learning about it today. Um, I think somebody had their hand raised. Yeah, and I, I see there is a question, Jen, but Jen is- um, uh, oh, There you go, I'm trying to on you. Okay, okay so, so the question um, for, Tracy is, what can we do to see the names that you mentioned added to the plaque at the Capitol? Hmm. Uh, well, I, I think um, it would just take an effort to, uh, to think about what, what names uh, might also be added and then uh, probably would go through the Secretary of State's office, I would think, yes. because they're yes. really involved. They're the ones who are involved in, in voting. Uh, but it seems like um, we could uh, we could widen the list of uh, you know who they you know because you just think the people who made the plaque in the 1930s was the league and so you know they wanted to honor uh, each other um, and rightfully so but I think the um, you know the people involved that that, that there's a wider a wider group that um, that we could honor. So I think you know it would take making the list and then um, getting into and and I know that the Secretary of State's office is celebrating suffrage for the year. So I think right. they would be open to such uh, yeah. uh, at such their uh, at their initial event before COVID nineteen. Uh, mm. caused the close down. 
there was definitely interest among all the attendees uh, and there were a lot of attendees. I think you were there, Tracy. Yeah. Uh, and there, I have a list of West Hartford women who were interested in trying to promote a change. But I think, you know, we just do have to have some kind of committee and the League of Women Voters sh should be involved. But this year has really upset what we are what our progress on a lot of things is all about so we should definitely follow up on that and see if we can do some of the background work and the proposals of why the particular women that are being proposed are uh, worthy of it and then come up with the fundraising that's going to be required and it i mean to put to make one of those uh to make one of those uh, signs is not that expensive. My guess right. is they probably have money uh, to do something like that. So it's really a question of gathering the um, the information that right. will take and a concerted the, the, effort. Right, and the support for that. And I know yeah. there are some more questions. So Jen, uh, Jen Matos, we'll turn it back to you. you I feel as though my brother has asked a question. Uh, about how long it took for women to be elected to the state legislature. Um, I'm just reading off the chat. Is that okay, Jen? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's totally um, fine. Uh, so um, in 1920, I believe there were six women who were elected uh, to the House of Representatives. And then it was 1928 before the first senator was elected, first mm -hmm. woman senator. So right off the bat, there were women who were um, who were elected. Fascinating. So. Um, so Molly wanted to comment that the PBS special on the suffrage movement is excellent. So if anyone wanted to check that out, uh, she recommends it. Um, Terry Wilson wants um, to know if you're going to write a book to honor these <laughs> determined women. Uh well, I don't think I'm going to write a book on that. So I've written a couple of articles, for instance, in my book, Life in West Hartford, I've written an article about Edna Pertel. Uh, I've written an article about Louise Duffy and about, uh, I have several articles I've written about the League of Women Voters here. And I've also written about women who um, gained political power in, uh, you know, the first big group of women uh, to be elected to local offices happens in the 1970s. Uh, so I've also written about them and you can get those online. If you just type in life in West Hartford, they'll, you can find their way, your way to them. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of books that have been, uh, that have been written this, this year on the suffrage movement. And it's, it's really interesting because um, the national story, when people focus on the national story, it's really um, quite different because those who are working on the national movement, that's their total story. Uh, but on all the, the state level, you just see these women who are involved in all these different issues, uh, suffrage being uh, suffrage being one of them. And so it, it, you, you really get a different story, I think, looking from the local level. Um, which I find to be um, fascinating. So, but thank you for to, encouraging me. Yeah. Going to that point about uh, the local level, you want to say a word about the research being done by a professor, another professor, doctor, um, uh, Brittany, um, who is uh, a professor at uh, Goodwin College. She's doing a different kind of research too. Yes, she's doing some really interesting research. And before the Fancy. pandemic, she and I served on a panel at uh, University of St. Joseph. And so she's really looking at African-American participation in the women's suffrage movement in Connecticut. And there aren't a lot of records in, let's say, the newspaper or in local historical societies. And so she... Um, really interesting. She is working, uh, looking in church archives um, for from historically black churches. And she um, uh, is really finding uh, a lot of information. And in fact, uh, there, there was a, 
um, um, in 1916, uh, the organizer that I was telling you about, Emily Pearson, um, uh, 1918, uh, they reached out to the African American population and uh, they had a meeting of 500 African Americans in New Haven. Uh, and they set up, you know, it's sort of interesting, they set up a separate, uh, what they call the Colored Suffrage League. Um, and so Brittany is doing a lot of work on um, finding the names of these people. And, you know, it, it really comes to one of these uh, things that's coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, say their names. What are the names of these women? Um, and so we have the name of Mary Townsend Seymour, but um, there aren't a lot of other um, women of color or even working women who are uh, part of the, you know, for the accepted story, I guess, that has been told over the years. So Tracy, we have a couple related questions. Um, yeah. We have a, a question from Molly, wondering if there are any African-American women on the plaque in the Capitol? Uh, no, that, that, there are none on that plaque. So um, that would be another, um, uh, you know, really a focus of the uh, history of um, getting names to put on a new plaque. And um, I also want to say that Kate Farrar is present tonight, and she said she would be happy to help in that effort. Um, so that's great. Um, thank you, Kate. Um, we had also a question um, about the, the image you showed of Alice Paul in the vintage car. So remembering the League of Women Voters, the 50th parade, um, not necessarily any uh, mention made of the compromises um, that, that were part of the 1919 and 1920 over racial issues. This is Ruth hoping that Connecticut activists, activists were not relegated to the back of any parade. No yeah, yes. Um, and I don't have any specific information about about that. I do know that um, the woman I talked about, Josephine Bennett, um, was very um, uh, very much a, an advocate for equality for African Americans here, and um, she and Mary Townsend Seymour um, worked together on uh, issues uh, on the suffrage issue and and other issues, um, but um, I, wait a minute, what, tell me, what, what was the question again? It was, I'm uh, wondering kind of where women re relegated, uh, hoping that, yes, that, that black, um, Connecticut activists were not relegated to the back of any parade. Yeah, um, Seymour knew not to go to Katherine Houghton Hepburn because she was not as open to this um, cross race connection as Josephine Bennett was. And um, as Seymour and Bennett both knew that. Uh, so, um, you know, there were people in the suffrage movement here who were not, uh, you know, who were, um, uh, who did discriminate against uh, blacks and Seymour found her way to Josephine Bennett who um, was, um, you know, who developed a friendship with her. So it's not to say that this organization was um, um, uh, free of, of the same types of things that Alice Paul uh, was doing on the, on the national level. And I think Emily Pearson was part of that because she really encouraged um, African-Americans to, um, uh, and help them in organizing um, as well. Um, we also had a question from Doretta. She was wondering, you know, we took that poll in the very beginning, and she was wondering if there are any results from recent surveys that might have actually been taken to explain why women don't vote today. Mm. I don't know. I don't know if Caroline is still there. She could help us because she's a pollster. Um, so I don't know, um, and, and I would think um, today that um, women would really be energized to vote. And I, I do think 
the democratic slate in West Hartford is a sign of this um, in, invigoration of women's interest in being involved in politics. Um, and since 1980, women have voted in larger percentages um, and certainly in larger percentages than, um, than men have. Um, so um, I don't know, I'm not a political scientist, so I, uh, I, I'm not so up on that, but um, I don't know if anyone else has anything they can add here. Um, Beth Bai added that they had to go against the party still in, in the 2000s. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, you look at the history of women who've run uh, in West Hartford, often they have had to go against the party to get the nomination. Um, so it's been, um, uh, you know, it's really, uh, it's really not not easy. Um, and still, when you go to the legislature, I mean, it's not like it's anything close to being 50-50 uh, male, female. And there are still, I mean, uh, there are still um, men, men are in charge. In a certain number of things, for sure. Yeah. I mean, the Republicans, the minority leader in the house is a woman. Uh, yes. But all the other leadership is, uh, is male. male. You're right. Could you talk a moment, uh, Tracy? This is from uh, Linda. Um, a, a little bit about women who were against suffrage. Mm. It's really interesting, Linda, because uh, when I first did this research, uh, I did it for my master's thesis at uh and that was in 1983. So how long ago is that? 1737, almost 40 years ago, I was doing this research. And I didn't want to have anything to do with the people who were opposed to suffrage. And I didn't include them at all in my, uh, in my thesis. Um, you know, I really want to write about people who I saw as champions and heroes. That, uh, um, But as I've done the work over the last couple of years, um, it's really, uh, I'm really sort of interested in what would lead people, what would lead women to say, I, I don't want that right. And, um, you know, it's, it's even, even today, uh, it's often thought that women in politics, you know, that women play a different role in politics and people talk about, um, you know, this image, are women the same as men? Or are women different than men? And there's this image of women in politics that they're going to come in and clean up politics and they're not going to be corrupt. And I still remember when uh, John Rowland was, uh, had to step out of being uh, governor and Jody Rell came in, there was a political cartoon of her with a broom sweeping out corruption. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, there is this, this idea back at the, in the early 20th century that, uh, you know, women shouldn't be degraded by the corruption of politics rather than, um, you know, that uh, women should be able to, to, get, into the, uh, to get into the mess. Uh, but it is an interesting thought about uh, these women like Edith Beach who... Uh, was very involved, civically engaged in her community. And it really is uh, the idea of the league, um, though the league says you need to vote, uh, but there are um, nonpartisan. Um, and there was this idea among these anti-suffragists that um, you should work for the good of all and that you should not be um, partisan in the work that you do. And I think that's a that's an interesting argument uh, that uh, that these women used. And you know, it always surprises me. It's sort of like the Phyllis Schlafly story of you know women should stay in the home, and then the women who are leading that effort are all out in public, you know, giving speeches and um, and not at all sort of preserving the home as Grace Markham talked about it. Uh, so I think it's, uh, you know, it's really instructive to see what 
uh, what arguments they used. And I haven't done a lot of work on that, but it would be interesting to see the demographic too. You know, are they all sort of wealthy society women who, um, uh, who were involved in this organization, which is sort of my hunch, but I, I don't know that. All right, so we have a couple more. Um, you know, Caroline's coming through for us here. Yeah, so Caroline um, said that the Knight Foundation recently did a very large study on adults who do not consistently vote, and she provided the link uh, for those of us who are who are on the chat right now, um, that we can look at, um, it's an article that is really talking about results of female not non-voters, um, and you can review the article and also the full report. But she also said that in general, um, surveyors find that women seem to feel like their opinion um, is not worthy, and that's why they don't vote. Doesn't that go back, Tracy, to our history too? How women have been told that they are to be in the home and that mm -hmm. we weren't worthy of having our rights up at the top. We mm -hmm. just had to follow our husbands. A lot of history there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, and um, I don't know if any of you heard uh, where we live this morning. Um, I was listening because my wife was on talking about childcare, but uh, there was also the woman who just won this um, case to allow for, um, to allow women running for office to use their campaign funds to pay for babysitters, um, or I should say pay for childcare. Um, and so, you know, women often, uh, you know, it's more difficult for some women who are, um, you know, t taking on more of the responsibilities at home to go out on the campaign trail. Uh, so, I mean, here it is 2020, 2020, and, you know, we're finally saying, well, yeah, maybe, maybe we should consider that. Um, and, uh, and thus allowing for women's voices uh, allowing for women's voices to be heard. So, um, so we also had a question, uh, just general housekeeping, wondering when this this program was going to be replayed, and it is actually live on Channel Five right now, and it will also replay tonight on Channel Five at nine p.m. And then, uh, for those who are interested in uh, in watching it, you can also watch it on YouTube. And for those of us who are um, on the Zoom call right now, um, there is a link in the chat function um, that will take you to the replay link. So you might want to share that with um, some people who might not have been able to attend tonight. I think that concludes our questions, Tracy. <laughs> Thank you so much for, um, for listening. And uh, those are really some great questions that, uh, that made me think, uh, think about what I'm uh, think about the research. So I really appreciate the interaction. Thank you. And uh, Tracy, I and the league, thank you very much for working with us on this project. We knew we wanted to do something to celebrate the 100 years of the league, as well as recognizing the work of the suffragists. And your presentation has been excellent. Certainly uh, so much information that and cause us to do a little reckoning ourselves, I think, about our involvement and how we should help to make things go forward in rights for women and particularly, you know, protecting our voting rights and making, helping to make people understand that it is a power that we should not forget that we have. So this was excellent. I mean, thank you for helping us to increase our knowledge and um, while we still have challenges, we really do need to get out to vote and exercise that right on November 3rd. I know all of the people listening to this program at this time will certainly be doing that. I encourage your friends and family to do it as well. Anyone that needs to find out if they are registered to vote can go to the Secretary of the State's website to find out. Um, 
And you can also find out where your voting location is if you don't know. Uh, there is a website, a portal that the Secretary of the State's office has to find that uh, information quite easily. And if you just put in the Google Secretary of the State's um, dot Connecticut dot gov, you will get all kinds of choices to bring you to that site. I want to thank everyone that's been involved in putting this together, um, including our director, JP Evans, along with executive director, Jennifer Evans, who is uh, in charge of helping us get all of our league information out to the public through uh, the West Hartford Community Interactive. We greatly, greatly appreciate that. And uh, Jen Matos, it's been very nice working with you and having you part of this program. So thank you everyone. Thank you for being with us. And uh, I hope we will have an opportunity to do more of this again. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Bye-bye.